of all first responders matter, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Vice Chair Carol Cook and the National Anthem. Colors will be presented this morning by the Gibbs High School U.S. Army JROTC under the leadership of Colonel Sandy Sadler. The National Anthem will be performed by Gibbs High School Vox Nova Chamber Choir under the direction of Matthew Clear. Please stand and remain standing until the colors have been retired. Chaplain Smith, good morning. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are grateful for another day. We are grateful for your daily blessings that you bestow upon us. Today we pray for our schools, our children, the teachers, the administrators, and the school board. Blessed that this board may make decisions that will benefit all who come through the doors of the Pinellas County School System. Blessed that there may be engaging teachers, wonderful students, and a great support staff. Grant that their classrooms will be a safe place of learning. Bless as this meeting move forth, and we ask this in the, your most holy and precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Mr. Clear, could you please introduce the second song? Yes, thank you. Our second piece will be Chaka by Sidney Guillaume. It's a Haitian piece, and we'll be singing it today in Haitian Creole. Oh, 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 oh,
I mean, wow. 
Wow, thank you so much. Très bon, uh, merci. And with my high school French, I've got to look up the words to that song, so I'm dying to know what it said. I could pick up a few here and there, but it was just amazing. Thank you so much, Mr. Clear, and congratulations. What, what a beautiful, beautiful display of talent and uplift for all of us for the day. Thank you. Mr. Brown, that was pretty great. Do you get to hear that every day, Principal Brown? I mean, that's, that's good stuff right there. Um, so we'll now share a video that shows a recap of Experience PCS, which was held at Clearwater High School just a couple of uh, weeks ago. So today we're super excited. We have our Experience PCS event, which is our second annual event, where we're showcasing the amazing programs that we have available to students in Pinellas County Schools. All right. We have four schools that are participating in a chalk mural competition. They are working with their art teachers to create a chalk mural to represent Youth Art Month, which is the month of March. And we have a culinary competition where our families are voting on their favorite sweet treat. to leave today experiencing the amazing opportunities that we have for students across all levels in our school district, all the way from our pre-K students all the way up to our adult education students. Thank you, pretty, pretty incredible to bring those number of programs and people in schools and then the number of people who attended, incredible to be able to um, display and show all the programs we have to offer. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Hill, for all the work that went into organizing that day. Next, we'll have the introduction of professional and community organization representatives, Isabel Mascarenas, our public information officer. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Hendrick and staff. It is my pleasure to introduce the following representatives of community and professional organizations. From the Pinellas Classroom Teachers Association, Lee Bryant, President. Representing the North Pinellas League of Women Voters, Vivian Posey, Carol Bailey, and Karen Glass. From the Pinellas Arts for a Complete Education Coalition, Terry Marks. Today, we have a presentation from the Student Rights and Responsibility Committee. Please welcome students Rebecca C. McCurtain and Jordan Martin from Gibbs High School and their principal, Barry Brown. Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me. I am Jordan Martin, and this is a message that goes out to the graduating class of 2024. <clears throat> As I stand before you today, I am filled with a mix of emotions. We finally reached the end of our high school career. Reflecting on the past four years, we can all realize how much we've grown, both academically and personally. High school has always been a roller coaster of experiences. From late night study sessions to unforgettable moments on the field or the stage, we've navigated through challenges, celebrated victories, and formed lifelong uh, friendships along the way. Now, everyone can agree that freshman year was like one weird dream. Whether you went on campus or online, COVID affected everyone, including the teachers. What makes us special though, is that we pushed through that obstacle to become successful. Each one of us has a unique story to tell. I would like to share my experience, not only as a successful scholar, but as a proud Gibbs gladiator. One thing I want to highlight is the campus activities. It's something new every time, and even if you aren't participating, you will still enjoy watching. 
ranging from activities like kickball to musical chairs to dancing, it's guaranteed to always get a crowd going. My personal favorite activity we did at Gibbs this year was Culture Day. It took place outside during lunch. Those who wanted to rep their ethnic background participated and dressed up in their attire and made things like posters, cards, and other items that are linked to their culture. Another thing that I'd like to do is thank the teachers and staff that helped shape me into the student I am today. I'd like to thank Ms., uh, Mrs. Corbett, uh, Mrs. Denard, and beta counselors like Ms. Miller, Ms. Brown, uh, Mr. Muha, you've been also great. And these are just a few things that the awesome staff at Gibbs uh, helped me with, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank them so much for giving me the opportunity to grow and prosper as a student. With that being said, my life as a gladiator has been a little bit challenging, but the ride was also fun. May we continue to chase our dreams and make a difference wherever life takes us. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Rebecca. When I chose Gibbs High School when I was in the eighth grade, all anyone brought up was my high school experience. I was going to be driving 30 minutes from my house in Palm Harbor all the way down to St. Pete for the chance to attend Pinellas County Center for the Arts. So I figured football games and pep rallies would not be my thing. I guess I was sort of right because I can't say that I ever made it out to a football game over my four years, but that didn't stop me from screaming my head off rooting for our boys that were winning the basketball state championship this year. So what led me there? What is my reason to shed a tear at graduation? It's the students and an amazing faculty. Let's start with PCCA, Pinellas County Center for the Arts. My reason for the 30 minute drive that turns into an hour drive in the afternoons. When I found out about PCCA, there was nothing that was going to stop me from attending and I'm so glad that my parents let me go. PCCA has done so much to help me these past four years. I got voice lessons once a week, dance classes every other day, acting and musical theater classes that delved into collegiate material. This past year, my musical theater teacher, Mr. Heinzman, helped me film pre-screens which function as artistic applications to colleges. These pre-screens got myself and my friends called back to some of the most prestigious theatrical institutions, including Juilliard, NYU, and University of Michigan. He had coached our whole class on the college audition since the beginning of our junior year, making sure that we were ready for a highly competitive field. Beyond that, PCCA has allowed me to experience leadership and dedication that I'm not sure I would be able to have anywhere else. Just this year, I got to help cast our District Thespian Festival, and I directed our large group musical of 15 people, which ended up getting selected to perform at Morsani Hall at the Straz for state thespians in front of an audience of over 2,000. All of this makes PCCA the best option for me, but it's not only the curriculum and opportunities that have made the program worthwhile, it's the student body. I have never been in such a supportive and kind place. With a small class size for each major, each class feels like a little family. My class has gotten together to have picnics, pitched in to get our teachers Christmas presents, and helped each other get through AP statistics. However, PCCA exists within Gibbs. So what about Gibbs? What makes Gibbs special? My parents had the same question when they were debating sending me to an IB program or a private school. Well, I can now say that Gibbs has some of the best teachers and students. The teachers I have had have been so wonderful and have taught me so much. I would not have gotten through all of the AP classes without the support of this amazing faculty. When I decided to go to Gibbs, I decided to participate in the AP Capstone Diploma. This involves passing six AP classes, including AP Research and AP Seminar. Both of these classes have been the most difficult and wonderful classes I have ever taken. AP Seminar, which I took last year, allowed me to learn how to collaborate with others, present an argument and defend it, and begin my own research. This year in AP Research, which is taught by Dr. Teo, a graduate of Texas A&M with a doctorate in science, I'm doing my own ethical research by putting out polls, putting together interviews, and creating a 12,000 word document that justifies all of that work. And it's not just my AP Capstone required courses that have allowed me to learn so much. AP US History and AP World were such a joy to be in that I contemplating majoring in history. AP Comp and AP Lit were so fun that I'm minoring in literature in college. Not to mention all of my AP Capstone required courses inspired me to plan to get my master's in dramaturgy to become a theatrical journalist. But just like PCCA, the student body makes Gibbs a joy to attend. Lunches alone are a permanent party. 
Every Friday, the jazz band plays in the courtyard. On the days of big games, our band, dance team, and cheer team holds pep rallies, and our PMAC club makes sure that there's always some sort of celebration, whether for Valentine's Day or Women's History Month. The Gibbs student body is alive and filled with pride. We are a group of students that hold our campus in the highest regards. All of this to be said, I am proud to be a gladiator. I am proud to be a part of a supportive and lively campus filled with amazing students and a wonderful faculty. The students are also backed by amazing community. If you've never had the chance to go to a Gibbs graduation, I would highly recommend because there is no energy greater than the gladiator nation watching their kids walking across the stage in May. It is often what inspires me to keep trying in class. The community of Gibbs is truly an inspirational community of students and families. So even after I walk the trop, I will be glad to say, go gladiators. And to all the people that question my high school experience in such a unique place, all I can say is don't knock it till you've tried it. I just so happen to have had the coolest and most special high school experience. It's even better than Ferris Bueller's day off. <laughs> Rebecca and Jordan, thank you so much for your presentation this morning. It was exceptional hearing about PCCA, certainly, but also about all the activities um, across campus and the, and, and the student body and just the feel. Um, we do have a Gladiator graduate on our school board, Mrs. Edmond, graduated from Gibbs High School. Um, and also that state basketball championship that your boys team just won is not just about basketball, it is about the entire campus and it's about the student and staff leadership and atmosphere that's created there that allows that kind of success to happen. So Principal Brown, congratulations. And Jordan and Rebecca, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. The next item on our agenda, um, amendments to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Hendrick, any amendments? There are none, Madam Chair. Thank you. Board members? Any amendments? Uh, seeing none, may I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I motion. Second. Motion by Mrs. Long and a second by Mrs. Myers. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. We don't have any items on our special or, uh, order agenda today. Mrs. Hauck, do we have any speakers to agenda items? Yes, Madam Chair, we have one speaker for agenda items. Thank you. Members of the public have three separate opportunities to address the board when we gather for a business meeting. The first is public comment on agenda items. The second is at public hearings, most of which are policies. And the last is after our meeting when speakers may address the general business of the district. At each opportunity for public input, board members are here to listen to you. This is not a time for interaction, but the board will take your comments into consideration before we vote on agenda items. The board is committed to a standard of civility and decorum in conducting our meetings. This includes refraining from clapping or making audible noises during or after a speaker's comments. We appreciate you assisting us in maintaining a civil and constructive environment. Lastly, please note that this meeting and all public comments will be broadcast live on the internet and the video will be publicly archived. Members of the public may always communicate with the board through our email address, board at pcsb.org, or by calling the board office at 588-6300. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, board members, Mr. Hendrick. Our speaker is Mark Clutho. He's speaking to items 7.7, 7.8, and 8.1. Mark Clutho Largo. 7.7, 7.8, St. Petersburg Collegiate High School. That's a joke. These charter schools, they ought to be outlawed, but calling it a collegiate high school? <laughs> yeah, right. Now, moving on to 8.1, the strategic priority, fiscal and operational responsibility. Uh, there you go again, using that word strategic. Uh, that's way past your whatever 
you say 3,126,000, the whole job is 5,326,000. But you're saying you're using these six pre-built classroom buildings to replace traditional classrooms, and this is economically efficient. Well, there you go again, using that word, you're not qualified. Efficient? No. You don't know what it means. You wouldn't be doing something like orienting that building up there in Clearwater the wrong way. You don't know what efficient is. You wouldn't mount imaging specular reflectors the wrong way. You wouldn't put clear story windows the wrong way. I could take all day describing all of your mishaps with the buildings. But see, what's happening right now 2023, the graph says it all, and you're doing your big part to make this happen with the stupid buildings <laughs> and say, Madam Chair, there are no more speakers for agenda items. Thank you. Item six, unfinished business. We don't have anything under that item. We'll move on to item seven, our consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval of consent agenda. Second. Thank you, a motion by Mrs. Cook and a second by Mrs. Edmond. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. We have one item on our non-consent agenda today, item 8.1, request approval of agreement with Creative Contractors, Inc. for construction management services in connection with the Pocket Village at Gulf Beaches Elementary School in the amount of $3,126,279, project number 9452. We have a motion to approve this item. Mrs. Meyer, motion, and second by Mrs. Long. Mr. Hendrick, would you introduce this item? Thank you, Madam Chair. We're excited to share with the board kind of an update from a workshop that we had several years ago as the board made the decision to get rid of leased portables and also try to get as many students as possible out of portables and into permanent spaces. And so Mr. Herbeck's gonna share this update with this project and, uh, and how it's gonna be for the students and improving the look of a neighborhood and school as well. Mr. Herbeck. Thank you, Mr. Hendrick and Madam Chair and board members, I think probably biggest question everybody has is what is a pocket village and so I want to give you a little bit of a background on that first and then uh, we'll share some slides with you a little bit later on but as Mr. Hendrick alluded to in 2017 the district set a goal of eliminating uh, what we used to call portable cities which is really these long-standing um, multi portable unit kind of deployments uh, that were used at one time for overcrowding and um, as, as an option to building a new uh, building our goal was to specifically eliminate those large scale portable cities which had six or more units and had been there a decade or longer. And we identified several schools, uh, but since that time, since 2017, we've accomplished uh, that goal at, um, at Shore Acres Elementary School, at Sawgrass Lake, at North Shore Elementary School, and at Sanderland Pre-K-8. And when those four projects combined, we eliminated over 50 portables and put students back into tr traditional buildings. We still have four more schools that have those six or more portables that have been there a decade or longer um, to go. And Gulf Beaches is one of those schools. 
And as Mr. Hendrick talked about, there's several reasons to eliminate those type of um, portable deployments. Uh, one of those um, is that schools really find it, difficult, it, find it difficult to create a sense of unity on their campus. And when you s go and, and visit one of those, they're kind of laid out in a traditional almost checkerboard pattern for efficiency of space and efficiency for covered walkways and things like that. But they don't have shared hallways or shared spaces. They don't have collaboration spaces for teachers or for students. And a lot of times they're placed in a part of a campus that's kind of away from everything else. It's really not in the, in the central part of the campus. And together, all of those things cr create a really sense of isolation. And so as we um, kind of started exploring different ways to eliminate these portable cities and different um, avenues we had, we wanted to look beyond the traditional building as we've done before and look at different ideas. And one of the ideas we came across is that of the Pocket Village. And again, Mr. Hendricks said that we shared that with you at a workshop a few years ago. But for the public's sake as well, Pocket Villages are really used by cities right now uh, to create multi-family housing options on small spaces. And you can kind of think of a small um, uh, lot or a small block somewhere in a city that you might have two or three traditional size houses going on. A pocket village, you could put a dozen or more houses in there, kind of this, the tiny house version um, that you kind of see on TV in some, I think St. Petersburg and a couple other cities here in Pinellas is doing that as well. The good news though is that that concept can be adapted to a school. And the really good news, it's cost, effic cost effective. Uh, this pocket village is running about two thirds the cost of a traditional um, concrete block building. So I think instead of trying to explain it more, uh, we do have some slides. And the first one that you see there is an overhead view of six of these pre-engineered, pre-constructed buildings. This is on the Gulf Beaches campus where the portables currently stand. Well, and I take that back, they, they're not there anymore. We have removed them, but where they once were. And you can see we've oriented those uh, to kind of s create this center courtyard, uh, give everybody a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging to a small little community out there. Um, and you can see the covered walkways that lead from the you know, traditional school. Um, out to the rest of the um, buildings. And our next slide will show you more of a ground eyes vi vision of that, um, looking east toward the rest of the main campus. And then we zoom in a little bit more on the next slide. And we have shade sails to provide um, shade and covering from the sun. And then our last slide, again, is a little bit more of a vision of one of the front of the buildings. Um, these are all um, steel framed. Um, the, the skin of the building, if you think of it that way, is composite material. We have some of the composite material has a wood look, some of it has a stucco look. Uh, but all in all together, what this does is it allows us to put these buildings on place in a very small uh, campus, and we can do it very quickly, which is a very, uh, which is a key at Gulf Beaches because there's no other place to put portables on campus while we build a building. So we have to have this done in two months. And so the buildings are on their way. Uh, we will have this done before a teacher's report in August. And with your approval today, we'll get started on some of the underground and other construction and um, have our first pocket village up and running before the start of school in the fall. Thank you. Board members, any discussion? Mrs. Edmond? Um, Mr. Herbert, you, you mentioned um, there were four, four more schools to go, including Gulf Beaches. What are the others? Uh, four in total. Gulf Beaches is one of those. The others are Anona Elementary School, Pasadena Fundamental, and Sutherland Elementary School. And, and again, I, I do, uh, I, I failed to mention earlier there, um, with a caveat, we still do need the use of the occasional portable. 
Yeah. So yeah. We, we won't be putting this in when we need one or two portables somewhere. Right. Um, and I mean, that, so this is our first time doing this concept, and I do remember looking at it closely in the mm -hmm. workshop, asking a lot of questions about the materials, that it meets code, you know, all the, all the pieces we mm -hmm. have to meet as far as hurricane, shelter, et cetera. Yes. Um, and, um, but, you know, it could be something we use at some of these other schools if, once, we, once we see how it is and works. Absolutely. We picked Gulf Beaches first because it's the most challenging project. So we figured if we can pull it off there, we can do it anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, with the motion in a second, uh, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving item 8.1, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. On to new business, item 9.1, items introduced by the superintendent, Mr. Hendrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome back to our board members and all of our staff and students from spring break. I know it may seem like so long ago now, but it's only been three days. Uh, and we have nine weeks of school left and lots to accomplish. And so uh, we're excited about this final home push here in the last quarter. Over spring break, though, we did have a number of academic challenges going on across the district. We had students in elementary school read over 15,000 digital books through one of our digital learning Myon uh, platforms. And we had thousands of secondary students compete in course specific challenges as they gear up towards the end of the year. Uh, just yesterday, we found out that one of our Pinellas County Schools volunteers was a finalist for State Outstanding School Volunteer, Mr. Bill Schmidling, who we honored uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, he volunteers and has for two decades at Oak Grove Middle School. He's one of three finalists for the State Volunteer of the Year, and we're so proud of him and his continued great work at Oak Grove. It was mentioned already, but uh, worth mentioning again, the congratulations to the Gibbs High School boys basketball team for their state championship, uh, 4A championship. They had a nice pep rally when the students returned to school the next day. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Edmond, Mrs. Hines for, Hine for making it down there. And also to our Eastlake girls soccer team, which finished a state runner up. Uh, I'm going to speak with them at their banquet here next week and congratulate them in person as well. And, and we're really proud of the work of all of our student athletes. You, you saw the video on our student experience, our second uh, PCS student experience. It continues to grow and change and, uh, and morph. Really neat to see those chalk art competitions, but also lots going on there. And the idea is to give families and the community, it's open to anybody, what's happening in Pinellas County Schools, and it was another great success. Uh, award season is beginning and is upon us, uh, so thank you to the board for being out and about for all these award ceremonies. We've already had the Yes I Can Awards. We've had one of our Take Stock in Children's uh, Scholarship celebrations with over 100 students receiving scholarships. We have another one this Friday with another 100 plus students receiving scholarships. And then lots of awards coming up, the Pride Awards, Honors Breakfast, Walker's Rising Stars, Verl Davis, Maria Edmonds, Carwise Awards, lots going on in the next month, so we're excited to celebrate our students. And Summer Bridge is registration opened yesterday. In the first 24 hours, over 2,000 families signed up for Summer Bridge. Uh, so families can check out our website and find out more about Summer Bridge registration and also learn about all of the programs that we have to offer this summer. We also have a couple of other things for families to check in on, and one of those is the ridership campaign for transportation. That also opened up uh, yesterday, and families received a call home. And we're asking them to log on. It takes, uh, the phone call says it takes one minute to do the ridership campaign. Uh, so just log on to uh, your focus account for your child and declare if you need transportation next year in the morning, in the afternoon, or both. So that as we plan out all those routes here in the next couple of months, uh, we can do so as efficiently as possible. That campaign last year really helped us trim our routes and make them more efficient, which means students get to school on time, which has been a much uh, improved effort this year. And lastly, uh, for the ESE portion of a request is for parents with students with disabilities. The annual state survey for families to complete that survey is out there as well. You can see that link on our website as well, and families uh, received a message about that. And finally, I want to honor one of our employees, as I do at each meeting, for recognizing and demonstrating our core values. And this meeting's uh, recognition is for school counselor at Skycrest Elementary, Mrs. Nemeth. Uh, Ms. Nemeth has been at Skycrest a number of years, but recently was uh, recognized by a colleague as a shining example of a role model and what a colleague should be. She has helped tremendously with students that I've had concerns about. She creates behavior checklists for my students to meet not only their needs, but also helping teachers so that we can be successful. She's always there to listen, support, and give suggestions while making you feel valued and heard. And she genuinely cares about students at Skycrest, taking her job seriously and literally putting her whole heart into the effort. 
our families and our students are grateful for her work each and every school day, and we are as well. Thank you, Mrs. Nemeth, and all of our employees for the work they do each and every day. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hendrick. Items introduced by the school board attorney. I have no items. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Items introduced by the board. Mrs. Edmond. Thank you. Um, I just would like to share that April 10th from 3 to 5 p.m. at Gibbs High School, the last student discipline community session for the 2023-24 school year will occur and the public is welcomed. Also, I would like to share that I continue to hold the status of a certified school board member um, through Florida School Board Association. And then just, some few, just a few highlights from my um, learning at the Council of Great City Schools in Washington, D.C. at the Legislative Conference a few days ago. I, I know I mentioned um, at the last board meeting how important it is to be able to learn, network, and bring that information back. And I want to share with you that you all should have received an email from Mrs. Helk which includes minutes from the fall board of directors meeting, as well as other attachments from um, the meeting that I attended um, a few days ago. And then I have some hard copies of things that you may want to take a look at at your convenience. Some of the sessions that I participated in were very informative, including the panel discussion from receiving updates on what's going on in Washington to looking at how states are being advocated, um, how states are being affected by education issues on a, federal, on a federal platform, for example, federal funding. Um, right now, there's a cut, a significant cut in federal funding in the House's budget, which could impact us if something doesn't change. So again, learning information about that and how what and, and bringing that back to our staff is informative to me because I think it provides the opportunity for us to look at what other things we need to do as it relates to budgeting um, as well as planning for the future if cuts occur. Additional topics that were discussed were chronic absenteeism, several, several of their task force, which many of our staff have an opportunity to um, chime in or provide feedback on and that was another insightful moment of being there that our district is providing information and collaborating with other urban school districts throughout the country and kudos to you superintendent Hendrick and staff for that work also I would like to just share that I was able to ask questions that was um, provided to me from Mrs. Dole and superintendent as it relates to the funding. And I've already shared some of those recommendations and suggestions with staff, as well as shared um, some of the feedback, as well as PowerPoint presentations with teaching and learning staff, minority achievement officers, school climate and behavior, as well as um, strategy and impact. Again, I think it's important when we are out at conferences to bring that information back and see how we can impact our district in positive ways. So thank you for that. And last but not least, at the next workshop, I, wish I will be sharing with the board, superintendent and staff requests regarding discipline, chronic absenteeism, mental health, and continuing the dialogue regarding bullying and harassment policies Yes, we had the first draft of conversation. However, I think it's important that we take a look at all of the bullying harassment policies if we're going to make changes in one. So I look forward to having that discussion at the next workshop. Thank you. Mrs. Kane. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a couple, just short, very short things to say. First of all, I wanna um, congratulate the uh, group from Gibbs that was here, what an, it was an incredible performance. They really did an amazing job. Um, it's such an incredible amount of work that goes into performances like that, and I just wanna give them a shout out that they did a wonderful job. I had the um, honor and privilege of being able to attend the uh, Florida State Senior Thespian 
conference that was in held in Tampa last week during spring break and got to see our incredible students from PHU perform their production of Chicago at the Stras Center. And it was such a privilege uh, and honor to be in part of the audience and get to watch them. And it really speaks to some of the um, incredible experiences that we're trying to provide for our students. And I just wanted to um, give you all a little update because I think sometimes we think of all the performing arts as the performers getting these you know, performance opportunities on stages, but there was so much more involved in this than maybe people would understand or know. Um, and when we talk about chronic absenteeism, so I thank you so much for bringing that up, one of our challenges and initiatives as a district was to provide better student experiences to make sure that we are uplifting students and inspiring them to attend school by giving them as many experiences that they may not be able to have from a digital platform. And I think that that is increasing. Of course, there's always more, but it opened up opportunity for conversation on even more experiences that we could have. But during the um, state thespian performance that they got to do. They were main stage, which was an honor in and of itself as a group. But the tech team from Palm Harbor, um, so congratulations to Ms. Timberlake, who is their performing arts coach there. Um, they had to move all of their sets, load a truck, unload it at the stress center, set it up, and reload it and break down all within a 24-hour period like a road show. So their uh, students who are working on tech not only had to stage manage, but work a professional lighting and sound, move their sound equipment to the Strass Center, set everything up in a four hour period. And they did it successfully. They did a beautiful and wonderful job. And what an incredible experience for all of those students who had the experience of working in a professional entertainment environment because that's what it would be like. And so I just thought that was um, really something that a lot of people don't realize they, they work. It was hours, it was weeks for them, and congratulations to them for a wonderful performance. And I know that um, our Gibbs Performing Arts, they're, they're doing some incredible things as well, similar experiences, and we are just so proud of them as a district. But it did open up conversations um, as I spoke with teachers and parents uh, in that experience of how we can even offer more certifications and experiences to expand upon what we're already giving for our students. So. With that being said, also wanted to note that um, I, I would like to second also Ms. Edmonds' request for the bullying and harassment policies. Um, I have some questions on that that I can follow up with at another time. But also um, next week we are holding the subcommittee meeting, for, uh, what is that, the 26th for the operating procedures manual uh, for those that were going to do that. And we'll give you an update at the next meeting when we come to some more conclusions. So with that, thank you so much. Mrs. Long. Thank you. I just want to encourage all of you, nine weeks of school left. It's hard to believe. But <clears throat> if you're retired, if you only work part time, please consider becoming a mentor. I have started mentoring a, a little girl at Cypress Woods, and I am having such an incredibly good time. I can see me staying and watching her go through high school. It is such a joy. She runs and she jumps towards me and she hugs me, and it is, you know, such a joy to help a child. I'm teaching her math because she's very weak in math, and I'm having a blast since I'm the one who's afraid of math. Uh, I think I'm learning just as much as she is, but please consider this. There are so many children in our schools that need a mentor, and next year to be able to fill as many of those requests as possible would be wonderful. It doesn't take maybe a half hour, 45 minutes of your time, but I promise you when you leave, you will feel so good because it really boosts your spirits. And I'm gonna add a few more next year as I see how my schedule goes, but what a wonderful opportunity. And it keeps you young, it keeps you vibrant, and you know that you're helping children. And that's what it's all about, so thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Long, Mrs. Edmund, Mrs. Kane. Um, we just got through spring break, and as we all know, it goes quickly from here, doesn't it? So let's just stay focused and bring it home. Thank you to all the all of, all of the teachers. One more quarter, um, 
and and it's going to be a great a, a great quarter and I know we're going to end strong um, I do want to acknowledge the summer bridge and the summer uh, so summer summer bridge and then summer camps this year which all filled up quickly uh, you know we nearly have year-round school available essentially here in Pinellas County Schools and I think it's incredible and I want to acknowledge too the extended summer bridge at some of our TZ schools and and so that's now a six-week program with activities and an in enrichments in addition to that study, and I really appreciate that uh, move. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I hereby recess this public meeting. Uh, we will now hear from public speakers. Mrs. Houck, are there any public speakers today? Yes, Madam Chair, we have eight speakers this morning. Thank you. So we'll move on to the public comment on the general business of the district. Please note that the views and comments of the public speakers are their own and they're not endorsed nor sponsored by the school board or district. We cannot ensure the accuracy of statements made, but will review concerns that are raised and take appropriate action, which may include clarifications or the referral of speakers to the proper staff member for assistance. The board is committed to a standard of civility and decorum in conducting our meetings. This includes refraining from clapping or making audible noises during or after a speaker's comments. We appreciate you assisting us in maintaining a civil and constructive environment. Additionally, please note that although board members or Superintendent Hendrick may leave the dais briefly, there are speakers in the back room and we will continue to be able to hear your comments. Thank you. Mrs. Hawk. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members, Mr. Hendrick. The first two speakers are Aunt Avila and Charles Derrickson. Good morning, um, Chairwoman and, uh, and Board Superintendent. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Aunt Avila. Uh, I am the Tampa Bay Community Organizer with Equality Florida. And I want to start with, um, once again, thanking um, the district for releasing its inclusive guidelines. Um, we very much appreciate that and have been um, sharing that news with teachers um, so that they can um, understand how to create inclusive environments for all students. Um, I'm uh, here uh, also to speak about our initiative um, that we've launched called Bring Back Books. So the district, um, like many, has seen um, a great deal of requests and reviews to, um, to remove books from schools, and we would really like to encourage this district and others to um, bring about policies that encourage books coming into the district from a really pro-literacy standpoint. Obviously, something everyone on this dais can agree um, is a priority for this district. Um, so uh, some policies that we would like um, to the district to, to consider are around um, allowing parents to advocate um, for books being in, in their child's school and um, inquire if those books are already. So there are processes placed to review books and remove books. We would like um, similar processes to um, inquire if those books already uh, are accessible to uh, students and if they're not, if they can be. Um, so we, again, thanks, thank you to the district and to the board for um, hearing the voices of the community um, and bringing about um, inclusive guidelines for teachers and, and staff to effectively serve the student body. Um, and we look forward to working with you on bringing books into the schools um, from a pro-literacy standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Charles Derrickson. Good morning, Mr. Hendrick, Ms. Hines, school board members and staff. I only have three minutes. Well, let me correct that. I will only have about one minute. I will have to allow two minutes for myself not to break down. First of all, I'm not here to accuse or to place blame. I'm here to ask for vigilance and help. I'm here to talk about Michael. 
Michael was a 2012 mayor of Enterprise Village, 2012 graduate of Ridgecrest Elementary, a 2014 semifinalist for Pinellas County School Board Youth Volunteer of the Year, 2014 recipient of the Doorways Now Take Stock Scholarship, 2014 member of the Seminole Middle School 5,000 Role Models, <clears throat> 2015-16 member of Dixie Holland's ROTC, 2015-16 member of the Culinary Arts Program at Dixie Holland's, a 2017 dropout from the Doorways Program, a 2018 dropout from Largo Senior High School, a 2018 victim of homelessness, a 2020 victim of psychosis and mental health issues. And on February 29th, 2024, eight hours after his 24th birthday, alone and cold, Michael became a victim of homicide. The question that haunts me is this, how did this child become a tragedy? What I do know is we missed something. Do we miss a two-point drop in grain point average in a year to a dropout? Yes. Do we miss the dismissal from a scholarship program? Yes. Why? We suspected drug use. Yes. We missed something because Michael did not hit one of our number targets. He flew under the radar. An average white male, average grades, normal attendance at first, no real discipline issues, just average. Did the school system fail Michael? Probably not. Did the legal system fail Michael? Most definitely. Did society find my file Michael? Yes. Did I fail Michael? Most likely. I don't have the answers, but I have the pain. I don't have the degree, but I have the pain. I don't have the knowledge but I have the pain. We can't allow this to happen again. Thank you. The next two speakers are Lee Bryant and Barbara Mellon. Uh, good morning, Chair Hine, members of the board, Superintendent Hendrick and staff. My name is Lee Bryant. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am the president of PCTA, the acting executive director of PCTA PESPA, and the head maintenance person at the Jade Mord building. Uh, for for PCD, PCTA to keep representing our members at schools, at the district level, and at the bargaining table, we collected showing of interest cards to submit to the Public Employee Relations Commission. The PERC rules require 30% of the bargaining unit to sign these cards so that we can trigger a vote on keeping PCTA as the bargaining agent. On the morning of March 5th, I hand delivered 4,030 signed cards representing 58.84% of the members of the bargaining unit to the PERC offices in Tallahassee. I even took the office people there a box of donuts uh, because they had a lot of work ahead of them that day. Uh, it's nearly double the amount needed to trigger the election, the next step in the process. The next step is a mail-in vote run by PERC, not by Pinellas County Schools, not by PCTA, but by PERC. Uh, and we have no idea when that will be. They are swamped, they are overloaded because of the legislation. We have no way of knowing it, but our contract remains in place and enforceable until the vote is called. PCTA is only getting stronger and stronger. The gratitude I have for the challenging work our staff and our members put in to reach that number is immeasurable. We have no quit in our office. Moving on to PESPA. PESPA begins its showing of interest card campaign this week. 
We look forward to having the same success as our sister union. Uh, the members of PESPA Bargaining Unit have an even greater opportunity to show their collective strength as this is an open book contract year for PESPA. We will need to show that we are standing together as we enter into contract negotiation to make life better for the employees that support our schools. We need to make sure our support personnel, our support professionals are fairly compensated and are supported by the school system. Because bargaining builds better lives, we won't back down. Thank you for your time. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm sure something at the office must have broken by now that I need to go back and fix. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. My name is Barbara Mellon, and I'm the parent of a third grader in Pinellas County Schools. I usually stay, stay up here and just urge you to ensure books are available to all students, to trust our media specialists and our teachers to do the job they are trained to do, and let a student's parent decide for their own child. Today, I want to bring up the settlement of the Don't Say Gay lawsuit. I'm sure everyone's heard about it by now. This settlement both affects books and the safety of our students, staff, and teachers. As school board members and educators, I'm sure you want all of our students, staff, and teachers to be safe in our schools. And I do recognize that Pinellas has an inclusive schools policy. I've read it thoroughly. And that policy means we have been on the forefront in Florida allowing GSAs, school safe space stickers, and similar. However, despite these guidelines, there is still so much bullying going on. Parent requests for inclusivity are ignored in various schools because of tradition. Our LGBTQIA students and staff are still not safe. As noted in our own inclusive policy, Pinellas County has one of the highest suicide levels in the state. So this means our policy is not stopping the harassment and bullying encouraged by this law. Just last spring, a close friend was told by an elementary school principal that her first grade non-binary student's safety could not be guaranteed. That student has since left Pinellas County Schools. With this settlement, our staff must be immediately notified that the policy is in place and the bullying and harassment cannot continue or be tolerated. And now notably, the settlement also includes a clarification of the library books policy, stating that library books with LGBTQIA plus themes may not be banned under legislation so long as they're not being used for instruction. While it's true Pinellas has not removed as many books as other districts, we still have removed books by and featuring members of the LGBTQIA community for no specific reason. These books have been challenged and removed or, without a, or have been removed or um, restricted without formal challenge. In particular, those that were removed last summer are, that were removed or still pending review. Now, statistically, we have had nine books challenged by parents or citizens, but 44 were removed or restricted. So the district's still not following their own process for book removes, removals. This continues to harm our children. Please follow this settlement. Bring back the books. Ensure our children's teachers and staff have, a safe, are, are safe and res, have safety and representation in schools. Continue to allow parents to restrict books for their own children. But in order to comply with the lawsuit, our policy must include returning books. Thank you. The next two speakers are Shantala Davis and Mark Clutho. Good morning. I stand before you not just as a concerned citizen and a native of Pinellas County, but as a mother, a grandmother, and a founder of a nonprofit organization that was initiated to assist the parents with life skills and empowerment with a mission to help reduce stress and prevent child abuse, neglect, and death of children. And in these current times, there are so many triggering factors in everyday life that mental health has become one of the greatest issues of discussion in almost every household. And with that being said, San Jose Elementary has crafted nothing but mental stress on myself and my family for many years now. 
My son, who is now 38 years old, attended San Jose and I was a young parent and always believed that the teachers and the school staff knew what was best. And I allowed them to label my son as a slow learner. Years later, I had my eldest daughter, who is currently 34 years old, and she also attended San Jose, and miraculously, she was labeled as a slow learner. But during her years of schooling, I started to learn about schools are able to get extra funding for children who were considered as having a disability, hence, slow learners. Many, many years later, <laughs> I gave birth to now my soon-to-be 17-year-old daughter who, was, who also attended San Jose, and guess what happened? Yes, she too was set to get the label. And after she was shamed, lied on, and mentally abused by her teacher, I had her removed from San Jose to a different school, and she excelled ever since. But the story doesn't end here. As I said, I am a grandmother, and I also have two grandchildren that currently attend San Jose Elementary. And ladies and gentlemen, what do you think is currently taking place? San Jose is now trying to label my grandchildren. San Jose has labeled my whole entire family lineage in one way or another in some type of way with some type of disability or slow learner. I find this remarkably absurd, disappointing, abusive, and mental and I demand answers and actions. I said, now we're so busy creating the outside appearance of these schools, but what about the inside and the people that's internally supposed to be planting power and seeds of greatness in our children and our families? San Jose has been doing this for years, and I'm sure that if you had children, my son, 38, my daughter, 34, and then you tell me, all the way down to a 70-year-old, something's wrong with all of my children, and now my grandchildren had to move back into my household while my daughter is looking for another place to live. Mr. Clutho. Mark Clutho Largo. Well, <laughs> yeah. there's an old saying, penny wise, pound foolish. And boy, that plan, 8.1, that says it all. Here's a primer on sustainable building. And there's a rendering here, the Anasazi Indians, over 1,500 years ago. They knew that proper orientation was the key to their survival. In discussing green design, a bit of historical perspective is useful. It's important to understand that the idea is not new. For millennial, most buildings were of necessity sustainable. It is only in the past century or so as cheap energy, large sheets of glass, and air conditioning appeared that architecture lost its moorings and forgot the ancient truth that the most important building covenants are dictated by the earth. Now you people, you know what you are? You are evil. Making sick buildings and destroying the future Here's this headline, the earth is hotter than we think, sponges say. These sponges without brains are smarter than you are. The headline, could the Gulf Stream be near a tipping point? 
This is what you're doing with your stupid buildings. That plan you have, it's about as dumb as you can do. It's criminal, malfeasance. Energy appetite in the U.S. endangers goals on climate, rising strain on grids. This is bad. I mean. The next two speakers are Nicole St. Ledger and Tim Conroy. Good morning. It's nice seeing everyone today. I know there have been recent calls for books to be brought back into our schools. With Pinellas County School records of reviewing and retaining books, you might not think that there is much that will have to happen with these new changes going on. But there are these words, to err on the side of caution. I've heard them spoken here, and I'm sure they have been spoken outside of this room too. These words have been said to protect teachers, administrators, and the district. But the consequences of those words have led books to be silently censored. Books have been removed from classrooms and media centers by teachers and administrators with no formal paper trail or specific request to remove them, to err on the side of caution. I am not saying this to disparage teachers they were protecting themselves in the light of vague laws. And I hope that any culling requested by administrators was done to protect the teachers and the schools. But these removals were noticed by our children, my child specifically, although I'm sure if she saw it, others did too. Now the laws are changed, so these books need to be brought back. Teachers and administrators need your support to bring those books back. Why is this so important? Because the books removed re represent specific cohorts of our communities. When our children do not see themselves in their learning or the resources around them, they do not feel supported and learning can be stifled. When they need support from their teachers, they are less likely to ask for help, whether in an academic setting or a more serious situation such as bullying. When children don't feel supported in the schools, incidents of bullying are, that is reported decreases. Returning books tell students they are seen and supported. Requesting teachers and administrators to return the books remind them how important these books are and let teachers and administrators know that you are here to support them. So please, let's err on the side of caution to support our children now. Thank you. And I'm done early, so I'm gonna add one completely off-topic thing about um, excused absences and graduations. Currently, a Pinellas County student attending a graduation of a sibling, it is not an excused absent if, if they miss schools. How, what a better idea for them to miss school to celebrate the academic success of a sibling. So please look into reconsidering that. Thank you. Thank you school board members, Superintendent Hendrick and district staff for giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Tim Conroy and I'm a proud member of Indivisible North Pinellas a nonpartisan organization that supports public education. I am not a member of the League of Women Voters of Florida. However, I come before you today to advocate for increased access to voter information and preparation for voting for young adults currently enrolled in the Pinellas County Schools. While this responsibility is currently exclusive to the Pinellas Supervisor of Elections Office staff who are required by law to make one visit to every Pinellas public school during the academic year, I am concerned that the task is too tall. Given the number of schools and students in Pinellas County, 
and many other responsibilities of the supervisor of elections office. It is unlikely that every student is presented critical voter information. This results in many students not knowing that they can pre-register to vote at age 16 or are eligible to vote once they reach the age of 18. According to Civic Center statistics, only 30% of eligible 18-year-olds are registered to vote. In our community, there are approved third-party voter registration organizations, including the League of Women Voters, which have a long history of providing voter information and protecting the right to vote for every eligible citizen. Their members are trained and certified to provide unbiased information about the voting process and voter registration assistance. Members of this and other nonpartisan third-party voter registration organizations could supplement the Supervisor of Elections Office staff efforts to ensure that even more students would receive this critical information. By increasing access to voter information through using approved nonpartisan community volunteers, there is a greater likelihood that all students are well informed about the importance of voting. This is as essential and as valuable as allowing military recruiters for the armed forces to inform students about career opportunities, training, and benefits of serving in our military. As board members, you are doing everything possible to produce responsible and engaged citizens equipped to make informed decisions impacting our society. I urge you to further your efforts by considering the use of approved third-party voter registration organizations, monitoring the number of schools and students who have access to voter preparation and registration assistant events, and making this information available to parents and taxpayers, or considering becoming a third-party voter. The next speaker is Sarah Peacock. Hello, thank you Chair Hine, board members, Superintendent Hendrick and uh, staff for your work and for your support and opportunity to speak. Um, I was really impressed by the choral presentation. It was incredible and I'm really pleased to see our students highlighting Haitian art, especially in a time when the Haitian people are in such desperate need of our support. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about chronic absenteeism. Um, the child labor bill, as you all well know, um, our very own Pinellas legislator, Linda Cheney, sponsored a bill to roll back child labor protections. Uh, Member Meyer's good friend, Bernie Jacques, voted in support of the measure, and it has now passed as a committee substitute. Um, as it has yet to be sent to the governor's desk, I have two asks. One is that we be thinking ahead to solutions. Um, I hope that our school board is thinking about planning for if this does become law, um, can we uh, support our guidance counselors and making sure that our students understand their labor rights and state and federal protections when they are now going to be entering construction sites and increased uh, jobs on their time away from school. I'm sure it's going to lead to more absenteeism. Um, I'd like to support them in protecting themselves since our legislature has seen fit not to protect them. Um, and since it has yet to be on the governor's desk, I hope that you'll all do everything in your power to lobby the governor to veto this bill. Um, in an effort to stay uh, on a positive note at the end, I want to echo uh, Aunt Avila's appreciation of your offering inclusive guidelines for LGBTQ students and staff uh, and support all of your work to bring back any books possible. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are no more speakers. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I hereby reconvene the public meeting. At this time, the school board will leave the dais to convene in a closed attorney-client session to discuss pending litigation. The estimated time of this closed session is 30 minutes. The attendees will include all school board members, Superintendent Hendrick, Deputy Superintendent Woodford, Kevin Smith, David Kapersky, William Keebler, Chris Altenburn, and court reporter Kathy Lyle.
I hereby reopen the public meeting after the conclusion of our closed attorney client session. Is there any final business from school board members before we adjourn? Seeing none, I now adjourn this public meeting.